The Hodgehog by Dick King Smith, the master of animal adventures. Illustrated by Anne Kronheimer. <laughs> Chapter 1 Your Auntie Betty has copped it, said Pa Hedgehog to Ma. Oh no, cried Ma. Where? Just down the road, opposite the newsagents. Bad place to cross that. Everywhere's a bad place to cross nowadays, said Ma. The traffic's dreadful. Do you realise, Pa, that's the third this year, and all on my side of the family too. First there was Grandfather, then my second cousin once removed, and now poor old Auntie Betty. They were sitting in a flower bed at their home, the garden of number 5A, of a row of semi-detached houses in a suburban street. On the other side of the road was a park, very popular with local hedgehogs on account of the good hunting it offered, as well as worms and slugs and snails which they could find in their own gardens. There were special attractions in the park. Mice lived under the bandstand, feasting on the crumbs dropped from listeners' sandwiches. Frogs dwelt in the lily pond and in the ornamental gardens, grass snakes slithered through the shrubbery. All these creatures were regarded as great delicacies by the hedgehogs, and they could never resist the occasional night sport in the park. But to reach it, they had to cross the busy road. Poor old Auntie Betty, said Ma again. It's a hard life, and that's flat. It's a hard death, said Pa sourly, and that's flat too. Talk about squashed. The poor old girl was... Shh, said Ma, at the sound of approaching footsteps. Not in front of the children. As up trotted four small figures, exact miniatures of their parents, except that their spines were still greyish rather than brown. Three of them, named by Ma, who was fond of flowers, Peony, Pansy and Petunia. Pa had agreed, reluctantly, to these names, but had insisted upon his own choice for the fourth. A little boar. Boys, he said, needed noble-sounding names. And the fourth youngster was therefore called Victor Maximilian St. George, Max for short. Almost from the moment his eyes had opened, while his prickles were still soft and rubbery, Max had shown promise of being a bright boy. And by now his eye, his ears and his wits were all as sharp as his spine. What are you talking about, Ma? he asked. Nothing, said Ma hastily. You wouldn't be talking about nothing, said Max, or there wouldn't be anything, any point in talking. Don't be cheeky, said Pa, and mind your own business. Well, I suppose it is their business really, Pa, isn't it? said Ma, or soon will be. They're bound to go exploring outside our garden before long and we must warn them. You're right, said Pa. Now then, you kids, just you listen to me. And he proceeded to give his children a long lecture about the problems of road safety for hedgehogs. Max listened carefully. Then he said, do humans cross the road? I suppose so, said Pa. 
but they don't get killed. Don't think so, said Pa, never seeing one lying in the road, which I would have if they did. Well then, said Max, how do they get across safely? You tell me, son. You tell me, said Pa. I will, said Max. I will. <laughs> Chapter 2 Max began his research the very next day. He slipped out of the garden at dusk, ambled along the path by the side wall of number 5A and crept under the front gate. Immediately, he found himself in a sea of noise. It was the evening rush hour and the home-going traffic was at its heaviest. Cars and motorbikes, buses and lorries thundered past. Terrifyingly close, it seemed to him, as he crouched outside the gate and he was confused and dazzled by their lights. The street lamps, too, lit up the place like day and Max, nocturnal by nature, made for the darkest spot he could find in the shadow of a tall litter bin and crouched there with hammering heart. Gradually, he grew a little more accustomed to the din and the glare and, though he dared not move, began to observe the humans for numbers of pedestrians passed close by him. They were all walking on the narrow road on which he sat, a rose raised above the level of the street itself by about the height of a hedgehog. They're safe, said Max to himself, because the noisy monsters aren't allowed up here. He looked across the street and could see that at the far side of it there were other humans also walking safely on a similar raised road. He did not, however, happen to see any cross the street. But they must cross somewhere, said Max. There must be a place further along the street. A part of him, for he was very young, said that he would find out about that another time and that it would be nice to creep back under the gate to his family. But then another part of him determined to set off to see if he could find this human crossing place. The street was on a slight slope and perhaps because of this Max chose to go in the downhill direction. He moved very slowly, keeping close to the outer walls of the front gardens where there was some shadow and he froze, stock still whenever a human passed. No one noticed him. Soon, the houses gave way to a short row of shops, one of them that very newsagent's opposite which his great Aunt Betty had breathed her last. And here his progress was more difficult. The shops were still open and Max had to choose his moment to make a dash across each brightly lit entrance. Phew, this is tiring. Perhaps I should go back home, he said. But then suddenly, not far ahead, he saw what he was seeking. There were humans crossing the street. Sometimes singly, sometimes in twos and threes, sometimes in quite large groups, they stepped down from the narrow raised road and walked straight across the street with hardly a look to the left or right, and stepped up again on the far side, and off they went. And every time that anyone wanted to cross, all the traffic stopped and waited respectfully until the way was clear again. This then was the magic place. Here, humans could cross in perfect safety, if humans can, why not hedgehogs, reasoned Max. But how do people know the exact spot? 
How do the cars and lorries know when to stop? Cautiously, he shuffled nearer, keeping close to the wall until he found himself beside a tall checkered pole on top of which was a glowing orange globe. Across the street, he could see was a similar pole and between these two poles, the humans walked while the traffic waited. Biding his time till a moment when there was no one about, Max crept forward to the edge of the raised road and peered down at the surface of the street. It was striped. It was striped black and white all the way from one side to the other. This was the secret. <laughs> Chapter 3 by now, it was quite late. The rush hour was over. The shops were shut. All was quiet. I'll wait, thought Max, and then when a car or lorry comes along, I'll cross in front of it. Soon, he saw something coming. It was a lorry. He was halfway across when he suddenly realised that the lorry hadn't slowed up at all and was almost on top of him blinding him with its brilliant lights, deafening him with its thunderous roar. It was not going to stop. Lorries only stop for people, not hedgehogs. The lorry driver, who until he was almost upon the crossing, had been quite unaware of the tiny pedestrian, did the only possible thing. With no time to break or swerve, he steered so as to strad straddle the little animal. Looking back in his wing mirror, he saw that it was continuing on its way unhurt, and he grinned and drove on into the night. The sheer horror of this great monster passing above with its huge wheels on either side of him threw Max into a blind panic and he made for the end of the crossing as fast as his legs could carry him. He did not see the cyclist silently pedalling along, along close to the curb and the cyclist did not see him until the last moment. Feverishly, the man twisted his handlebars and the front wheel of the bicycle suddenly wrenched round, caught Max on the rump and catapulted him headfirst into the face of the curbstone. <coughs> the next thing that Max recalled was crawling painfully under his own front gate. Somehow, he had managed to come back over the zebra crossing. He had known nothing of the concern of the cyclist, who had dismounted, peered at what looked like a small dead hedgehog, sighed and pedalled sadly away. He remembered nothing of his journey home, wobbling dazedly along on the now deserted pavement, guided only by his sense of smell. All he knew was that he had an awful headache. Family had crowded round him on his return, all talking at once. Where have you been all this time? asked Ma. Are you all right, son? asked Pa. Did you cross the road? they both said. And Peony, Pansy and Petunia echoed. Did you? Did you? Did you? For a while, Max did not reply. His thoughts were muddled, and when he did speak, his words were muddled too. I got a head on the bump, he said slowly. The family looked at one another. Something bought me on the hitum, said Max, and then I headed my ban. My ache bad's headly. But did you cross the road? cried his sister. Yes said Max warily. I hound where the fumans cross over, but... But the traffic only stops if you're human, interrupted Pa. 
Yes, said Max, not if you're a hodge hag.